May 12, 1905. Editor of the Snyder Signal Star, Judge W.M. Allison. Printed in Frederick, Oklahoma. When the spared people crept out of caves or came from houses which had not been claimed by the wrath of the wind, they stood for a moment stunned and dazed. Frantic appeals for help and pitiful moans of the dying fell upon dulled ears for an instant, and then the town awoke to the necessity of action, and the work began. Soon the dead and wounded were both being carried into available rooms, but later the rescue work was devoted alone to the living, and this work continued throughout the night. Oh, for daylight was the plaint of many burdened hearts as they sought for loved ones, and the air was filled with cries welling up from hearts filled with anguish when the lifeless forms of dear ones were found. The Pritchard Building and the Peckham Building were in a few minutes filled with the injured and dead. Both living and dead were horrible in appearance. Clothing had been torn into rags or completely from the forms. Through the slimy black mud which covered every face, it was almost impossible to recognize features. This made the work of identification very difficult, and most of the identifications were arrived at through recognition of some article found on their persons. Soon the search for loved ones was transferred to the rooms temporarily turned into morgues and hospitals. Oh, the agony of it all. The uninjured searching among the dead and injured for some lost one. The pitiful inquiries made by injured ones for those that were with them when the storm struck, and their appeals for further search to be made. Men who had not shed a tear for years cried like children. There was no effort to conceal the tears which forced themselves into the eyes of those whose desire to assist forced them to look upon the awful sights to be seen on every side. Pen can never describe the horror of it all, so that those who have not passed through similar trials can arrive at one-tenth part of the awfulness of the suffering of the injured and appearance of the dead. Soon after the storm had lulled, the block in which the Chinese laundry was located, and which had been heaped in a pile by the wind, was found to be burning. A strong north wind was carrying firebrands to the business houses, which had been left standing, and a heroic fight was made to prevent a general conflagration. Luckily, the gutters were so full of water that water enough was secured to put the fire out. It had to be fought by inches, the crackling flames roiling and pitching, as if jealous of the havoc the wind had made in so short a time. A fire also broke out in the partially destroyed Worsham building, but quick work overcame it, and the Woodard, Tennyson and Hoffmaster, and Way buildings were saved from general destruction. Daylight came, and permitted a view of the destruction wrought. Where hundreds of dwellings had stood when the sun went down, not an upright stick remained, and but an open prairie greeted the eye. As was said before, the ruin was complete from where the storm had struck the town, a little north of the schoolhouse, and on the west line of town through to the northeast part of the town. It mowed a path from five to seven blocks wide. Nothing stood which was in the path of the storm, and many buildings which were not in the direct path were wrecked. Not a building was standing which does not show some of the storm's work. Not a person who was in the direct path of the storm escaped serious injury or death, save those who took refuge in storm caves or cellars. Not a horse, cow, or pig escaped. All fell victims to the greedy storm. The work of rescue was resumed as soon as daybreak, the injured being cared for first, and the dead then gathered up and hauled to the morgue by wagon loads. It was a gruesome sight, and yet men and women who would ordinarily shriek at the sight of blood and suffering, with set features stoically went about the best they could for those who needed help. A hospital was established in the large room at the west side of the Hilton building, and all would be conveyed there who had not through the night been taken to some private residence. The Tennyson and Hoffmaster building was taken as a morgue, and very soon the floor of the 50 by 80 room was crowded with the remains of men, women, and children. The sight was appalling, 
and only the awfulness of the occasion gave men strength to properly care for the bodies. Every stitch of clothing which had not been torn off, and every part of the person exposed, were simply solidly cemented with a slimy black mud. The clothing was removed, the poor mangled remains as nearly cleaned as they could be, and each body wrapped in muslin to await final burial. The shelves and the counters were filled with these, reminding one of the stories of old catacombs where tier above tier of bodies are to be seen. Volunteers were called for to dig graves and make coffins, and though many responded, not much headway was made the first day toward burying the dead. Relief Parties Soon after the storm, S.B. Odell walked to Mountain Park and gave the alarm. But he talked so daffy as everyone who went through the storm did, that people wouldn't believe him. He had been followed by Edgar L. Beale and Fred C. Schwister, and when they too told the story of the awful calamity, the town was aroused and every man able to get here came over and assisted our people in work of rescue and such other work as was needed. The writer, with others, was fighting the fire when a party of men came up and said, We are here to help and others are coming. It was the first of the kindly feeling which soon came to us from all surrounding towns, and their promptness will always be treasured in the memory of those who met that first party. When Schwister and Beale succeeded in arousing the mountain park operator to the needs of the hour, the news of the calamity outspeeded the storm, and all the towns within reach began making up special trains. The train from Hobart, which arrived between 3 and 4 o'clock a.m., bringing 75 men and women, several doctors among them, was the first to reach here, and no party of people received a more heartfelt welcome than they did. It was not evidenced by a noisy demonstration, but by silent pressure of the hand and tearful expressions of gratitude. Following the Hobart train, special trains arrived every few minutes, and our people soon realized that the disaster had made all people kin, that everybody within reach of us was our friend. Soon cars loaded with needed supplies for hospital and homeless people began to arrive. Hundreds of ladies have come in and offered their services as nurses to the sick. Many have served as long as they could and then given away to others who were anxious and willing to assist. Snyder owes these noble women a debt of gratitude which can never be amply repaid. On Friday, two heavy rainstorms came, and as the roof had been partly torn from the building in which the hospital had been opened, it looked much for a time as if the sufferers would all be drowned, but speedy work by many willing hands saved them, and then they were removed to another room in the same building. This room was too small, and Dr. Borders, who had been installed as head surgeon, insisted on a better room. As none could be found which had escaped injury, a roof was put back over the first room by Pete Cohen and a gang of volunteers. A partition was run, an operating room built, and drug room arranged, and all the patients returned to the room Sunday morning. They are now as comfortably situated as they can be made under all the circumstances. Doctors from other towns and scores of ladies and gentlemen have, from time to time, taken their turns as watchers and nurses, and the wounded are being well cared for. Cleaning up. Sunday, a hundred men came down from Hobart and organized into ten companies with a captain over each. These men will ever hold the admiration of Snyder. Monday, a party from El Dorado and some from other points returned, and good work toward clearing up debris and burning animal carcasses was accomplished. The Territorial Engineering Corps, under command of Captain King, have been valuable assistants in maintaining order and cleaning up. They too will ever be dear to Snyder. The town will be rebuilt. The work of restoring buildings has already begun, and though it will take the town some time to fully recover its old appearance and activity, it will certainly do so.